pray with me. And they said unto him, Sir, we would see Jesus. On this Easter Sunday, we pray so by your Holy Spirit. In his name, Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful Easter Sunday it is. It's been pouring with rain in England, so I'm glad to be here uh, with you at this Easter. Hard to remember, though, that on the 24th of February, just a year ago, that's one year, one month and 17 days, Europe changed. The greatest, the largest refugee crisis since World War II began. Millions of people were displaced. Yes, Russia invaded Ukraine and an estimated 200 soldiers and civilians have lost their lives since. And four times as many, almost a million, have been injured. <coughs> I've become rather addicted to an English news channel called Sky because they give a daily briefing on the war and you can see how Ukraine is doing. Now don't get me wrong, there are innocent people on both sides of this conflict. There are innocent conscripted soldiers who haven't a clue why they are in Ukraine. And yes, I am praying for peace, but I'm also praying for a Ukrainian victory. That's about as political as you'll ever hear me get from this pulpit. But we all want to be on the winning team. Lucy and I, as you know, live just outside Bath. And Bath is a fine university. It's ranked either sixth or eighth in the League of Universities. But uh, Bath is known not just for its academic prowess, but also for its athletics. If you were a follower of the Olympic League tables, you will know that Britain, although a relatively small country, often comes second or third in the Olympic rankings. Bath University, if it was ranked as a nation, would come seventh in the world. It has so many Olympic athletes at its university. A friend of mine happens to be the Vice Chancellor, the President, and uh, I was visiting him and uh, he was explaining the regime that these athletes have to go under. Every mouthful of food that they consume is carefully monitored. There's no Easter eggs for them this year, I can assure you. No chocolate to be consumed. They have to be singularly focused on winning. A far cry from the man who was at the time just a general practitioner, a doctor in Oxford. He happened in fact to be my stepmother's family doctor. And early in the morning on May 6th, 1954, he went to the Oxford Athletic Grounds as he did most mornings. But for the first time in the history of the world, he ran a race that would change running. He ran a race that beat the four minute mile. No one had ever done that. He wasn't a professional. Yes, he might have watched a little bit about what he ate. He was focused, but he went back that morning to his surgery and continued being a doctor. His name was Roger Bannister, Dr. Roger Bannister, soon to become Sir Roger Bannister. Some years later, he wrote, the man who can drive himself further once the effort gets painful is the man who will win. The man, and it could be the woman, who has driven him or herself further once the effort gets painful is the person who will win. And the business world is no different. It may surprise you not that the Episcopal Church owns Wall Street. There's a little church called Trinity Wall Street its endowment is as big as all the combined endowments of all the Episcopal churches in the United States put together. And so it was that I was visiting the rector, a friend of mine, and he said, would you like to go onto the floor of the stock exchange? He said, I can go because we own it. And so I went. It was quite something. Talk about a fierce competitive edge in that room. The energy was amazing. The language, a little colourful. 
But there, above everything else, was this big sign. Outsell, outbuy, and outperform. Outsell, outbuy, and outperform. And yet that's driven so many people through the years. One of the greatest of that was Thomas Edison, a man who invented so much, over a thousand patterns, the light bulbs that we use now, the first movie cameras. He had a vast empire that outbought and outsold and outdid everything. And yet, and yet there's nothing left of Edison's empire. The 100,000 people who worked there, yes, the town is still called for him. It's still Edison in Orange, New Jersey, but it's just a few buildings owned by the uh, national parks. Everything's been sold off, went out of business, it's been torn down. You see, Thomas Edison, though he was brilliant, couldn't share the glory. He couldn't share control, not even with his own children, who simply lost interest. Today, Jesus understood true glory. True glory, the lasting glory that comes not from winning an Olympic medal or inventing a light bulb, but glory that comes from God alone. Just before the passage we read in John 17, Jesus, hanging on the cross, says to his heavenly Father, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. Trophies collect dust. Businesses go bust. And yes, even some of the best sermons get forgotten. I'll say that again. Even some of the best sermons get forgotten. The ultimate glory unfolds in the Easter story. Good Friday, Jesus, innocent, without sin, pays the price for us all. But it doesn't end there. On the third day, he defeats death. And here we read the story of Mary going to the tomb, the empty tomb. And there we see that the body of Jesus is gone. In Luke, we hear that the two angels actually address her and say, he is not here. He is risen, just as he said he would. If you've been at the children's uh, family service, you would have heard the history of the Easter egg based on those 13 words. The Easter challenge is to live lives that reflect Jesus' glory, not the glory of the world. The Jesuits have got it right. Because everything a Jesuit does always ends with three letters. S, D, G. And those are Latin inscriptions for soli deo gloria. The Latin scholars amongst you will see soli, God alone. Deo, God. Gloria, alone, God, gloria. Glory to God alone. Soli deo gloria. And I want to challenge you this Easter Sunday to reflect on those three letters. Maybe the S is for self-deflecting, learning that whatever we have achieved in life, whether great or little, is all from God. That there's nothing we have done to earn it, that it is a gift from God. Scotty Scheffler, the white man who won the Masters on April 10th, 2022, and... $2.7 million to boot, said this. For me, my identity isn't a golf score. My wife, Meredith, told me this morning, before my final Masters round, if you win the Masters today, or if you lose by 10 shots, and you never win another tournament again, I'm still going to love you. Jesus is still going to love you. Nothing will change. He went on to say that all I am doing is trying to glorify God. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm in this position. It's hard for us sometimes, but we're all called to deflect whatever glory we are given, whatever praise we have upon our shoulders, to deflect it to the person who's given it to us, to God. So that's the S. What about the D? Well, I think that's discerning obedience. It's being willing to listen to God, even when God takes us to places we don't expect. 
Henry Nouwen was one of the most profound theologians of the last century. His writings have had resonation, have resonated through the years. He was a humble man. He was the senior tenured professor at both Yale and Harvard simultaneously. One of only two people who have managed that. He was at the height of his academic success. He was basking in the glory of the Ivy League. And yet, at that very moment, he felt the nudge of God that he couldn't deny, calling him away. It didn't make sense. It didn't make any logic at all. His friends scratched their heads, but he left those hallowed halls, that ivory tower of Yale and Harvard, and he went as a volunteer for the rest of his life to the Arsh community, a community of physically and mentally disabled adults. For now, and the challenge wasn't competing in the classroom, writing great books. No, it was learning how to serve, to feed, to wash those who couldn't care for themselves. He devoted his life to their service, but remarkably wrote some of his most profound works while serving at the Arsh. That's where he lived out the rest of his life, and indeed where he died. He was willing to discern what God would have him do. It may not be as extreme as Henry now, but God might be nudging you this Easter Sunday to do something you hadn't thought about. So we've had the S, we've had the D. What about the G? God's glory. God alone is sovereign. We may control our lives or think that we control our lives, but God ultimately, our lives are in his hands. You see, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. True Christian glory is that we belong to God by faith. Through his grace in Jesus, we have the promise of eternal life and glory. Very often, very often, you are confronted by people who live lives that really are very self-centered, lives that focus solely on their own sense of purpose, their own sense of achievement. You've heard me say that you never see a hearse with a U-Haul, but we do try and convince ourselves that we can take it with us. I've been privileged to meet some of the true saints. One of them, George Gallup. George and Kitty were friends of Lucy and myself. George had inherited the Gallup polling organisation from his father. But George, before he went into business, was an all-star athlete. He was Princeton, he was captain of both the Princeton football and baseball teams in one season. He was an enormous bear of a man. He was a successful businessman. He took what he'd been given, what he inherited, and grew it enormously. He was a generous benefactor. But more than anything else, he was a follower of Jesus Christ. The climax of that, for me, was his funeral. The good and the great had gathered in Princeton Chapel. There was the president of Princeton, and all the other Illuminati were there. The governor of the state was there. You could recognise some of these famous people who turned out to see George off, because he was dearly loved by the whole community. But George, being George, had left just one thing up his sleeve, right to the very end. You see, as George's coffin was picked up by the pallbearers, and as it was turned around and made its exit out of that enormous chapel at Princeton, from nowhere, a Dixie band appeared, an enormous Dixie band that played up, oh, when the saints go marching in. That was George. That was George to a team. Vibrant, funny, having the last laugh, but also true to George. For he was a saint, and he was going into glory. See, George understood what true glory was. This Easter, we celebrate the glory of an empty cross. We reflect on its meaning for us. I hope that in our funerals one day, we will go out to the tune 
oh, when the saints go marching in. But for now, today, this week, in the months that lie ahead, may we all reflect on our lives, on this Good News Sunday, the good news of a risen Christ, and may we be bold enough to end our letters, our work, our families, indeed our lives, with those three words, soli deo gloria, to glory to God alone. Amen.